All right, so our, our final illustrious speaker of the morning, Mark Messenbaugh. Um, I'm not gonna read anything of his bio because he instructed me not to, so there you go. He basically said, just tell them I'm a lawyer. Pause for effect, that's my part. <laughs> Thank you. Who saw the light and joined with Somalogic 10 years ago tomorrow. That's right. To make right. Larry's dream, his vision become a reality. So I'm just gonna turn it over to you, Mark. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and, and thank all of you. This is, uh, gosh, nine, nine years in. Larry has put together something really special. Meredith, you've done a remarkable job getting everything uh, together. And this community has really come together over the years. Uh, and this has been a terrific morning with some great speakers. And each year, I've been surprised on the upside at how great the talks are. This morning has been no exception, and I hope by lunch, uh, you're not uh, suggesting that we change that. Um, Larry, Larry asked me to speak this year, and it, because it's been so great over the years, it was a real honor, but I had a couple reservations about it. The first was Larry had the bright idea of suggesting that I'm going to speak in the science section. Uh, and you heard my background. I'm a, I'm a social studies guy by background, philosophy and history and politics and economics, and then I went to law school. So. As Sarah just alluded, you have a lawyer standing in front of you giving a science talk. Let that sink in and calibrate your expectations uh, <laughs> uh, accordingly. Where's my clicker? There we go. Is that it? Oh, it's point. But I did have a good science teacher <laughs> along the way. We, uh, this was, this was a, a, a lesson in evolutionary biology that Larry was given giving to me, and one of those is his biological son. Um, I would have loved to cue an orangutan right now, but Nick's in the room instead. Uh, the, uh, I'm not a lawyer anymore. I've, I head corporate strategy and development for Soma Logic, and I've done it for a while now. As you just heard, this weekend marks my 10th anniversary of being with the company. Some of you know how I joined. I heard, uh, I was doing something completely different. I was in uh, nonprofit world and uh, kind of at the edge of government. And uh, there we go. The nonprofit world continues, Larry points out. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, not yet profit. The, so, so I uh, was invited to a talk that uh, the Colorado Biosciences Association uh, was hosting at the Colorado State Legislature, and they invited five CEOs to come talk to the legislators about. Uh, their companies and the impact on Colorado. And there were four CEOs who got up and they're very well dressed and they um, you know, talk about their phase two drug or their phase three drug or they've just launched. And it's, it's interesting stuff, doesn't really light me on fire. And then this crazy haired scientist comes to the podium and says, I'm not gonna talk to you about a product, I'm gonna tell you how we're gonna transform healthcare. And he proceeded to spin this yarn of the wellness chip, this idea that you could measure in a single blood test everything that mattered and tell people what they needed to know about their health so that they can do something in time to make a difference. And I was smitten. And I followed him out of the lecture hall and I stalked him for a couple weeks. And uh, well, long story short, I, I started working for Soma Logic and that was, when I walked out the door, I said, that's what I'm gonna go spend the next 10 years of my life doing. I'm gonna go make that a reality with Larry. And so here we are, 10 years in. It's a nice time to check in. Um, the, uh, the other reservation that I had a little bit when Larry invited me to talk is because this is an academic symposium, and what I want to talk about is a corporate vision. This is Soma Logic. Uh, I'm going to tell you what Soma Logic is doing. And, thought for a moment, can I, can I get away with that? And I decided, yeah, I, I probably can because actually it's Larry's vision. And I will bet you that almost everyone in the room, directly or indirectly, is here because we believe in Larry. And this is what Larry believes in. And we all want to know how the story comes out. I can't tell you how the story comes out because it's still a work in progress. Um, what I can tell you is where we've come from I can tell you where we are now, and I can tell you where we're headed, uh, and I hope that it's as good a yarn as Larry told me 10 years ago. So opening up, I saw a band, The Killers, recently here in 
just outside Boulder, and their lead singer, Brendan Flowers, opened up with that line, people don't come to hear perfect, they come to hear you sell it. Uh, so here goes. <laughs> this is an old vision. Um, this slide, I didn't put this together, I took this from a deck that Larry made in the year 2000. He gave this to uh, a presentation to DARPA saying that this is what the future was going to be and that this is what he was setting out to build. Um, he said that we were going to be able to build a platform that could move you from disease diagnostics to wellness, that over time it would amass knowledge about um, more and more diseases to definitively diagnose them, um, that ultimately it would include what he then said, this sort of everything to everyone, all maladies, everything you need to know, and that over time, that regular measurements on that platform would become the guiding light of, uh, by which patients, as you see there, patients follow their health, their lifestyles, and the onset of disease, that it would become that important. That was Larry's vision from the future, or from the past, and what I'm here to say is that actually we're on the cusp of launching version 1.0 in reality. It's a momentous occasion for a guy who's been here for 10 years, for a guy who's been working on this for 20 years. This is a real milestone. By the end of this year, we will launch version 1.0 of that platform into the National Health Service to actually care for patients in Leeds, England. It, took 17 years. it only took 17 years, but who's counting? <laughs> so when I first started with the company, um, I had a long commute and uh, as I was driving, uh, my social studies brain started musing on different topics, including the name somologic. So it's Greek, as you know. It, it means the, the meaning of the body or the words of the body. And I always liked that. I thought that was kind of a, a nice idea for what somologic was capable of doing, for what Larry was setting out to do. Um, and in my social studies brain, I started thinking what else I knew about Greece. Um, and I thought about this place. This is the Temple of Apollo at Delphi. And in the Greek world, this was a center to seek wisdom. People would come here from all over the Hellenic Mediterranean basin, and they would ask questions that mattered to them. They would ask questions um, of this priestess who sat above this fissure. And by all accounts, she was stoned out of her mind all day long because of the fumes that would come out. And they would ask things that mattered to them, and she would mumble something, and the temple uh, authorities would kind of interpret that, and kings would go off and start wars, and you know, common people would go and create marriages. People would actually follow this source of advice, the Oracle at Delphi. Um, and above the door, when you walked in, was the summation of Greek knowledge, which was, or summation of Greek wisdom, which was to know thyself. Um, and it, it had a kind of a philosophical, spiritual character kind of connotation. But again, I liked this as a, as a metaphor for what Somologic was setting out to create, to know thyself. So what do you really know about yourself? What do you know about your body? What do you know about your health? Um, I'm going to ask you some questions now, and don't answer by raise of hands. Actually, toward the end, you're going to have a chance to do a little bit of input, audience input. So it'll be an experiment. Um, but first, just think to yourself, what do you know about yourself right now? Um, who here is super healthy? Everything is firing on all cylinders. And how do you know that? And who, who's not quite firing on all cylinders? Who suspects there's something going a little bit wrong? And how do you know that? And how do you know exactly what is going off kilter? And who knows that they have a chronic disease? And so there really is something wrong. It's got a name to it. Do you know actually what's happening to make that thing wrong? And do you know what you should do about it? Do you know that you're on the right treatments? And if you are on some treatment, do you know if it's working? What do you know about yourself and how do you know it? Well, before getting into the how and the why, or the how and the what, let's talk about why. Why do you want to know all those things in the first place? What difference would it make if you did know those? 
So I borrowed this beautiful piece of artwork from David Lawrence, who gave this talk at the symposium six, seven years ago. Um, David's wife is a terrific uh, artist, and he came up with that. Uh, <laughs> no, they, it's, it's so simple. It, it, it makes the point so elegantly, <laughs> because it shows that what we have today is an imbalanced system. We have a system in medicine that takes heroic actions to care for the sick and does relatively little to care, to prevent people from getting sick, to care for them before they're really sick. And of course, it doesn't take too much imagination to say, gee, there must be a better model. There must be a better model. Obviously, we're gonna still take care of the sick, but maybe we can do a better job of primary care. We can take care of more of the problems at that entry point into the health system. And actually, maybe we can do something more. Maybe we can actually take care of the problems before they require us to go into the health system in the first place. Maybe as consumers, um, we can actually take better care of ourselves and we can actually work with people in the community to get in front of the right goods and services that can actually keep us healthier and bend this cost curve of people suffering and spending lots of money on, on sick care. And so what could do that? How could we achieve that? Well, um, Patty said it nicely, data-driven health. That's our mantra, data-driven health. Um, that's what we believe is going to change this healthcare system. And specifically, you need to deliver the right information in the right way to do three things. First, you have to do a better job of health assessment. You have to figure out, for people in the community, who really is healthy and doing just fine, who's getting a little bit off track and needs some kind of intervention, what, what is that intervention, what do they need to change to stay on a good track, and then ultimately, when they're going off track too far, who needs to be triaged into the sick care system? Second, when people do enter into the sick care system, what exactly is wrong with them? Let's get precise about our diagnoses. Let's get precise about our prescriptions, get them the right drug at the right time, and then let's monitor to make sure it's actually having the impact that we want it to. And third, let's remember that healthcare is not just an individual exercise, it's a social institution. Um, we all are in this together, if for no other reason than we pay insurance premiums. And so we have to think about it from a population level too. So within a covered population, whether you're an insurer, a health system who's contracted for a population, or a national government, who in your population is getting sick? For what reasons? What's driving these big, bad, expensive outcomes that are debilitating people, costing us lots of money, reducing productivity, creating human misery? And what can we do about them? How can we get the right resources in front of them to actually change that curve? Those are the tools that we need. We need better heuristics, better data-driven health to guide those. And if we succeeded, maybe we could actually start delivering them so that their decision tools that change the location of care away from experts to less expert places in the care system, away from, special, away from hospitals into specialist care, away from specialists to GP care, away from GPs to nurses, away from nurses to maybe all the way into community, all the way into us caring for ourselves. If you could create those better tools, you could actually change the way healthcare is delivered. That's what Larry set out to do in the first place. So what's the information that you need to do that? We've got the why, now let's talk about the, the how and the what. And do it by a metaphor. So now we're out of healthcare for just a moment. Say so you're a pilot, it's a cool job. A lot of us wanted to be a pilot and didn't make it. Um, so you're a pilot of this jet plane and you're responsible for flying it, flying it's on its mission, not crashing it. How do you do that? What do you want to look at? Do you want to look at this? This is important, this is the blueprint. You get the wiring, you get to understand the thrust capacity, you get to understand um, everything that this aircraft is capable of delivering. Or do you want to look at this? A dashboard of real-time information that doesn't tell you how the thing was built in the first place. It tells you what's happening on the right now. What is your actual pressure on the wings? How full is your fuel gauge? Um, what's your altitude? How are you flying this plane right now? 
Um, I saw Neil Siegel just walk in. Neil, when he was up at the podium a few years ago, talked in a beautiful way about moving in the military from uh, schedule-based maintenance, check up every few years, to condition-based maintenance, having enough sensors on the plane to figure out when things are going wrong and make sure that at the right time you're actually bringing it in for service before you crash. So we're gonna to try to build a dashboard of health. What information are we gonna put on it? Sort of a Marco Rubio moment. Excuse me. What are we gonna put on it? So Larry started off with the central dogma, right? DNA makes RNA, RNA makes proteins, proteins do something. They're the active molecular agents of cellular biology. They are the sentinels of what's happening. Um, they're the place that we need to, that we're gonna get the right biological signal for real-time health. Going back to that blueprint metaphor, you know, people over the course of their lives have the same genes, same background of genes anyway, um, and their proteins change, and that's what's responsible for what they are right now. My kids, when they saw this, they loved that the 45-year-old was that shape. <laughs> uh, and then they pointed out that the 70-year-old uh, wasn't doing well either. <laughs> Same genes, different proteins over the course of your life. Same genes, different proteins. <laughs> I, think, I think Larry was 25 then and had just graduated uh, uh, from grad school. Thank you, Carissa, for getting me that. <laughs> and since I thought my kids were gonna be here. I wanted to put one up. This is a shameless plug. Um, same genes, that little guy was just born when I was starting up, uh, taught my discussions with Larry, and now he's that monstrously big person over on the right, and since I was gonna put one of them up, I had to put all of them up. Um, and I know they're not the same genes, <laughs> but they are different proteins. So you're gonna to wanna to measure proteins. And because diseases are multidimensional, because people are complex, you're not gonna to wanna to measure one or a handful of proteins, you're gonna to wanna to measure a whole lot of proteins. This is one of my favorite slides to use when we uh, talk with pharma, when we talk with health systems, um, because it shows, you know, when you're talking about diabetes, you're actually dealing with this incredibly complex intersection of, of comorbid patients and you're not trying to solve one of their problems, you're actually trying to keep their plane, their plane flying well and so it's a really complex process. We need a lot of biological information to understand all parts of how they're doing at any given time. You wanna measure a lot of proteins. Where are you gonna do them? Since you're gonna to wanna to get a lot of information, you gotta get it all in a simple way. That means you're gonna to wanna to collect as much information from one test as possible. And so this also comes from Larry's 2000 deck. The idea that you're gonna measure it, you're gonna measure these proteins in some kind of an integrated matrix, a sample that will pull information from lots of different parts of the body. And on first principles, the obvious answer is blood, because it picks up the signals from all over. And if you could, urine would be even easier because then you don't have to get stuck in the arm. And you don't have to ship things frozen. It's just, it would be, it's, it, would, it would change the way people could access the system. And because people change over time, you don't wanna measure it once, you wanna measure these proteins longitudinally. You wanna keep measuring them. This is one person's proteome measured monthly over the course of four years, and it shows that while there's a great deal of consistency, there are also these swings where groups of proteins make these correlated moves um, that you can tie into specific health events in the person's life. So that's starting to take the shape of your kind of longitudinal dashboard of real-time information. And you want to do it on a platform that can scale. So this is the heart and soul of the company. This is what we spent, how many years do you want to say, 15 years making hum? A lot of money. This was hard to do. Uh, it started off with Larry's core invention of Selects, the Aptimers. But then all the reagents had to be reinvented over the course of the mid-2000s, and then a new assay format had to be invented that took advantage of the special biochemistry of those reagents, allowing you to do a single reagent, one molecule binds to one protein assay, 
and get the kind of signal that you could otherwise only get with two binding molecules. That lets you get to the scale where you measure thousands of things. You can measure it with the precision that's required. You can measure it with the throughput that's required to actually do population level health. And you can do it now for the first time at clinical level results. We actually have what's called a CLIA laboratory that delivers this 5,000 protein measurement assay. There's nothing like it under the sun. And that's the realization of his technical vision. It took a lot of people, including many in this room, I saw Naboisha up there, um, a lot of people, many, many, many years to make that true. And it's a thing of beauty. And we're not done, because over time, this also came from the year 2000. <laughs> This isn't a new slide, thank goodness, because that's not a great piece of art. Um, this also came from that year 2000 deck. This vision's been consistent for a long time, that we want to get to a point where it's not just living in a clinical reference lab, but it's actually distributed. It's literally in your toilet, so that you can be measuring these things often, in real time, close to you, and actually get this information on a constant basis. So this is in the works. Jason Cleveland's up there working hard. Uh, on this with some others in the room. Data, of course, aren't enough. If we gave you 5,000 points of light, they wouldn't mean anything to you. What we actually need to do is interpret them. So you heard a little bit from Patty about um, big data analysis. You're gonna hear later from Craig Mundy and in previous years from Larry Hunter about the kinds of tools that we apply to extract from all of these data wisdom, insights, algorithms, pieces of math that correlate specific protein measurements to things that you care about, measurements of a body's current state or near-term future events. So what you want off this platform isn't simply lots of data, you want it to be insights about health condition. And that, in a nutshell, is what Larry set out when he used to call the wellness chip, and we now call the SomaScan Health Information Platform. That's what we set out to do, that it's a single integrated platform measuring thousands of proteins in blood or urine sample with data analytics to reveal insights that guide and monitor the management of health and complex chronic disease. That's the buildup to it. That's what we've been working on for all these years, based on what Larry set out a long time ago. And how do we do it? So where do we get these health insights? I loved Patty's talk coming right before mine. I appreciated it because it talks about the library, this great big library. If we were a genomics company and we wanted to create a platform offering, sharing the insights of the genome with people, and there are companies who are doing this, what they can start with is by scraping all that beautiful literature that Patty and others have assembled and actually getting a jump start on all the insights, correlations between specific genomic genetic markers and health insights of interest. But in the proteome, there's really, there hasn't been a tool to measure it well enough, and so therefore, the library isn't written. We have to write our own library. So the place we start is with collaborations with biobanks. We have to amass hundreds of thousands, millions of clinical samples, and great clinical measurements, because of course we want to correlate data with hard measurements in order to create these algorithmic surrogates. So we partner with some of the world's biggest biobanks, a lot of them in the United States, a lot of them in the UK, they're really all over the world, to assemble all of these clinical samples. We do a remarkable job pulling them in, and we run SomaScan data on top of all of them. We apply machine learning and AI techniques to extract the insights and together compile that into this complete picture of health that's coming off the platform. So that's a little abstract. Let me just give you a couple concrete examples so you have in mind what we mean by an insight. We published this in JAMA about a year and a half ago. This is an early piece of work, extracting insights from the platform. What we set out to do is create an algorithm, an insight that could predict um, who in a high-risk population was going to have a cardiovascular event, a heart attack, a stroke, or heart failure. And we showed that we could do so using a fairly frugal panel of nine proteins um, and that we could do it with performance significantly better than either genomic markers, which really don't do a lot to predict events, or with clinical 
surrogates, Framingham, so that includes cholesterol and body mass index. I mean, some things that you know kind of are used in traditional medicine. The short version of that is there's more signal to do these predictions in the proteome than there is in what we're using today. It's what Larry said, this is what Larry told us was gonna happen in the first place. And not only does it do better predictions, it's actually dynamic, because if you want that longitudinal dashboard, you want it not just to be a single time point. You know, if you did a genetic test, it would give you a single time point. It would be relatively invariant over the course of your life. Um, and then you wouldn't know quite when the event is. This proteomic signature, on the other hand, actually changes with your condition. So it's what you want. As you get closer to a heart attack, the signal warning goes up. If you're doing something good for your health, the signal warning goes down. It's kind of the, it's what you want from your longitudinal dashboard. So that's what we mean by an insight. And the way we think about putting these insights together is you're not gonna deliver one insight, you're gonna start with a clinical problem. So let's take this one. You have a, that kind of roundish shape guy from the uh, silhouette, that cartoon, who's in his mid 40s. And you say, gee, you know, the, the naked eye can say that person's at risk of diabetes. Um, how do we prevent them from getting full blown diabetes? So the first thing we would deliver are scores, actual risk scores, quantitative scores that say what's the absolute likelihood that this person will be diagnosed with diabetes in a two, three, four year period. And attendant to that, what's the absolute quantitative risk that they're gonna have a heart attack, a stroke, a heart failure, that they're gonna lose kidney function, that their liver's gonna fibrose from fat deposits. So risk scores that say, how much should I care about this person? And then another layer of information that says, why? Why is the risk what it is? And here we get into systems biology, we get into physiology, are their kidneys functioning or not? Do they show signs of insulin resistance or not? Do they have adequate muscle mass? What's their visceral fat load? And we show also signs of lifestyle. So these are things that actually you could learn from other sources. Are you smoking? Well, you know if you're smoking or not. Um, but we can actually show the molecular telltale signs that that smoking is causing you damage. So whether you lie or not, whether you lie to yourself or not, we can show that that is one of the drivers, alcohol use inactivity, the things that you might most commonly view. And we package all of those insights up and we deliver it to you as a person, you as a caregiver, you as a health system to say this is the risk and this is the driver of the risk and now let's talk about what to do about it. So that literally is this version 1.0 of the platform that we're gonna put into the hands of clinicians and patients in Leeds, England, for the NHS to start caring for people differently. Um, that's the list of initial insights. You see there's some in gray, it's because they're less related to the prevention of diabetes, they're more related to different kinds of populations, but what you have is this expanding menu of insights that we can deliver in packages for different kinds of use cases so that People can understand this particular person, their risks, their drivers, and what to do about them. And that's actually the dashboard that we're gonna put into people's hands, the report. You can just kinda get a sense of how this thing's gonna read out. It's pretty exciting for those of us who have been here for a while to see this coming. So there's your dashboard. That's the new dashboard of health. Right? This is the real-time information set that's gonna enable people to change the way they manage their care. And the system, we think, generalizes into a whole solution at scale. You take longitudinal proteomic measurements on SOMASCAN, you integrate other health information to the extent it's relevant and desired. You tie that in through the bioinformatics into insight bundles, you put decision in, support interfaces on it like those reports, and you deliver it out for those three domains of how we're gonna change healthcare. The health assessment, managing wellness out in the field, uh, precision diagnosis and treatment, and precision population management. And where are we gonna do it? Or what's it gonna do? First thing it's gonna do is enable health systems to do what they want to do. Um, 
you have to be careful about bringing out a tool like this. You could, you could really botch the job after having so many years of having developed it beautifully, and now you botch it bringing it out to market. That wouldn't be any good at all. And so we think that um, it's important to establish the credibility of the applications of this platform on the same great science that the technology was built upon. So we're gonna start with health systems, really high quality medical systems. Um, and medicine in many ways is a mess, as we know, especially fee-for-service transactional medicine, but there are these health systems, these integrated delivery networks that are thinking forward and they understand that same need to drive the location of care to the left on that spectrum, to bring it to less expert, and they know on how they need to change um, their own way of operating, and it usually goes for them under this rubric of the quadruple aim with improved patient outcomes, lower costs of care, happier patients, more satisfied caregivers. And that tool set that we're bringing out, we will deliver decision interfaces across the domains of the patient, the caregiving physicians, and the administrators to achieve this mission. It's not lost on us though that a lot of us, I mean, you know, literally us in the company, we wish we had access to this platform. We'd love to get ourselves characterized. And maybe a few of you in the room are thinking the same thing. And what you might want to do is first know for yourself how you're doing. And then you might want to be able to share that information with the right people, right? You've kind of got this body of insights. And I don't want to put it out into the world necessarily. What I would like to do is be able to broker that information to a little bit of it might go to my uh, fitness trainer and a little bit of it might go to my nutritionist, just enough for them to do the job that I'm asking them to do better. And sometimes I'm gonna share it with my doctor because my doctor needs to see it, or my insurer, or my pharmacist, or whoever else needs it. But the body of information lives with me. I'm in the middle of my own health picture. You're gonna be at the middle of your own health picture. And you're gonna share information with people on an as-needed basis to help them help you live the healthiest that you can. That's the vision, that's what we set out to do. This is the platform by which we're gonna do it. And I wanna now turn this into a little bit of an audience participation thing. Um, it won't be verbal um, from the stands. This is an experiment, I've never actually tried this program before, but in a moment I'm gonna show you a link. This concept of know thyself, what do you wish you knew about your health? Let's not make that a rhetorical question. I'd like your feedback, I'd like to hear from you what it actually is that you would like to know about your health. So that maybe a year from now, two years from now, when you're coming back here, this thing's available. And you're gonna get a dashboard of information back and some of the information on it, you're gonna say, hey, that's exactly what I hoped for. Because you're going to have influenced it. It's an experiment. So if you will indulge me over the lunch hour, there's a text thing here. It's not short, sorry about that. And at present, they, they, they replaced the UGH, the UG of my last name, with the 319. So Mark Messon, bah, 319. Um, would, if you would send me one or two words, like what do you wish you knew? It could be a few more than that. Um, what kind of information should we be thinking about building onto this platform? What insights are you looking for? Thank you. We have some questions for Mark. There's a question right up here. So the activities of proteins are often modified um, after the proteins and uh, are made, and you quantify, you know, the total protein, but it's influenced by the post-translational modifications. And I wondered if you're going to try to capture that in future versions of um, soma scan. And then uh, the second question, <laughs> okay, answer that question. No, no it's this okay, go, go, I, I won't forget the related. first. Related, so protein uh, may change over the course of years, as you pointed out, but they may also change over the course of a day. And I wondered if you've done any experiments to find out whether uh, that's true in, in your platform. Can you capture that? Uh, thank you, Tom, and thanks for picking on a lawyer with questions like that. Uh, 
So I'll give you my best answers, and I wish I could do it in an English accent as a surrogate for Steve Williams, who would be better at answering this question right now. But first question, post-translational modifications. What do we think about them? First, these binding reagents, at the end of the day, we're not literally quantifying protein concentration. We are quantifying binding events, right? We have somomer reagents. They bind to proteins in their three-dimensionality, and they do so with a very consistent um, so long as neither of those two things has changed, so long as the protein doesn't change, they're very consistent in it. Now, what happens when this protein changes shape due to post-translational modification? Well, if that is where the binding takes place, we will see that as a change in signal. So we will have, let's call it a shadow of that piece of biology, if it's blocked by another protein, whatever it might be. So we'll see it, we could see it as a change in our binding event and therefore in the RFUs that actually are the, you know, the quantitation. Um, you asked a, a nice question, are, in future, are you gonna actually try to get at it more deliberately? Naboisha and team are working on exactly that. Can we find ways to actually um, design, hone in on specific post-translational modifications? A tricky business in part because of the lability of those proteins, but we're, we're, we're working on some different strategies to do it. Right now, we have a platform that's beautiful in picking up reliable signals that have biological information and then translating that into events. So that gets kind of to your second question, which is the, the time frame, let's say, or the, the, the wavelength of the biology that we're picking up. Um, yes, we have studies in circadian rhythm. Um, yes, we have studies, you know, you might have seen the one that Rob Gerson put out in circulation on, uh, you know, kind of the cascade of proteins that come right after an induced MI. Um, so we see some of that stuff. We really, what we try to do is figure out what's the insight that we want. If it were a short wave, you know, kind of a three month kind of a horizon, then we'd have to design a study that has that built into it. If it's a two to five year prediction of heart attack, we'll design a study that has that in it. And the way we design these cohort studies sourced from the biobanks is that in such a way that any natural variation, whether it's daily, whether it's population variance, whatever it might be, will be built into the study. And so therefore, the signals that come out predicting this end state should, in theory, as long as the math guys who are very good have kind of um, tested all of this to make sure we're not confounded by something, they should take in that variance into account in order to have a useful insight. Is it pure biological research? It's not, it's applied research, right? We're trying to do something specific in the world. But do you have to pay attention to what time of day you take your study? Um, in some cases we do what we, you know, the world being messier than we wish. You know, you kind of want to have a test that's robust to a variety of collection conditions because we don't know that the patient we're going to test will have paid such close attention to our collection modalities. And so therefore we say, hey, let's, let's make this robust. I'm bound and determined to have this woman in the blue be able to ask a question. So another science-y question. You've got 5,000 proteins you're measuring. How many of them are useless? <laughs> Meaning you've never seen them function in any of the assays you've been, you've been measuring, any of the health measurements you've been well, looking at. I, I went to my cheat sheet, Larry, and he said half. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So far. You know, we're just scratching the surface. So maybe, you know, maybe the useless will eventually rise up and be useful. Here's hoping. I'm gonna send you on a run right over there. I've got, I've, I've got my eyes on. I've got striped shirt. You got them? Striped shirt, that's hot. All right. Mark, this is a more lawyer-friendly question for you. <laughs> 23andMe got into tr some trouble a few years ago trying to return a flavor of this information directly back to consumers. How do you guys enable this division of consumer dashboards without running into some of the trouble they had providing that information directly back to consumers? I choose not to respond to that on advice of counsel. <laughs> We're working through regulatory strategy now. As you know, the CLIA LDT regs, um, the FDA withdrew its guidance on uh, you know, kind of bringing all those into pre-market or uh, you know, 510K submission before you can bring them out. Um, but you know, this is, this is a platform that we want to transform the world and you don't want to do that on the, on the sly. Um, and so having a, a, a robust dialogue with FDA is going to be really important. You want to calibrate that right. So, so far we're starting with the CLIA LDT route. Um, it's a legitimate way to get into market, uh, but over time we're going to have to establish a relationship with the FDA 
that helps them understand the quality of the science that we're doing and not just accept it, but actually come to rely on it. Let's have one more if we have one. And everybody's like, uh, oh, okay, we've got, how about right down here? Hi, um, the, the science is wonderful, but you have huge sociological issues, don't you think? <laughs> to, to yes. <laughs> is that <laughs> the end of the question? Is there anybody <laughs> addressing, <laughs> addressing these? Mm -hmm. uh, we're, you know, we're just, we're just scratching the surface. We're just, we're just getting into it. So yes, we're thinking about it. I think the first in line are the privacy regs, right? And that's... Uh, well, no it's just getting people on board with they can control their, they can take care of their own health mm -hmm. because we've, you know, had a, had a program for a long time is you, you go to the doctor, the doctor gives you the fill, pill to fix you and not that you have control over your own health. And that's a, a huge obstacle, I see. I, I think what you're saying is right. You know, the counter argument, of course, is of course we have the right to take care of our own health. And so, you know, there's, those are the outlines of the policy debate. On the one hand, this information is so complex, can we dare trust individuals with it? On the other hand, who are we to say that individuals can't have information about their own health? And somewhere in between is going to be kind of a synthesis of the best of those two arguments into the way we deliver. Um, uh, from our standpoint, rather than jump right into that 23andMe style. Um, that's one of the reasons why we're starting with really high quality health systems, the NHS, you know, Kaiser, whoever it might be, CU Anschutz, I saw Don in here someplace. You know, um, let's, let's kind of jump right in with really good medical systems. Let's let them be the mediators of the information. Let's let them help us understand what the safe ways to deliver information, guidance to people. You heard in all these, we are delivering information to people, but we're doing it as part of a relationship with their care team, right? We're not doing it to them in the wild in isolation. Good luck with your info. Um, we're going to do it to help build a, a high quality medical interaction between patient provider. Well, no, I don't think we do have to go. I mean, it, it happens that we have had an extraordinary set of opportunities. Richard Barker knows all about these um, in the UK, and so we're starting there. Um, the next act will be here in the States because this market, this health system is near and dear to our heart and too big as a commercial opportunity to ignore. Um, so we think there are some opportunities here, but you have to do it carefully. You have to do it with um, the docs, not against the docs, I think. Mark, thank you very much. Thanks.